Hi, I'm Kyle. Today I will show you how to take great pictures of your models. Why you should listen to me? Because I have over 15 years of experience working for printed media where I was heavily involved in many photo sessions. I even have pictures of my miniatures taken in a professional studio. And I also worked for a women's magazine. At one point I was also running professionally a TV studio. Look at the guests this day. The guy here is the current Prime Minister of Poland. And this bloke down here is our ambassador to Israel. That said, I am definitely not suggesting that my way of taking photographs of miniatures is the way. This video is also not aimed at professional photographers doing pack shots of SKUs for Games Workshop, but at people that want to express their creativity, so use it as tips, not as an ex cathedra guide. Remember that my creed is to enjoy wargaming as a fun, social and laid-back hobby. So let's see how you can improve your photographs. Tip number one, the backdrop. First and foremost, you have to set the stage right. You don't need a lot of space. You would be surprised how small TV studios can be. Sometimes the host can't even rotate in his or her chair without knocking walls. Let's start by removing the clutter. This Venetian vase of Murano glass is a piece of art, but it is still not fit to participate in the shoot. Moving on to creating a decoration. I roll out a green mat. You may use something else, that's simply my style. Just remember that it forms a backdrop to the models and should not detract from them. Then I set up terrain. I like to place this wall at the end of the table so it forms a natural end to the stage. Some people use mountains or dense trees for that. If you do the photographs right, actually this should be a little blurry, so you don't need to be perfect with them. I like the pictures on my wall, but I still hide them. Maybe your wall is just right if it is right color. I got myself a foldable rack though to hang any backdrop I want. It costed like 40 bucks and I can change colors at will. Although I have a, a large selection of colors, I still prefer medium gray as it is the most natural, does not detract from the models and makes setting white balance easier. By the way, here's an important note if you want to go for a white background instead. Your camera tries automatically to average the scene to middle gray. If your background is white or black, you will have to adjust the exposition setting manually. Just like when shooting scenes on snow or at night. By the way, if you don't want a scenic mat for the base, you can always roll the backdrop on the table to form a uniform, continuous background. Tip number two, the window. Many people will tell you that you need studio lights for a proper picture. Well, this is true-ish if you are shooting people. For miniature photography, the normal light that comes through the window is absolutely enough. What's even more important is that if you wanted to use normal studio lights, you would have to actually paint your miniatures in a different way. The same as actors' makeup is different for stage than it is for normal everyday use. When I was running the TV studio, I had to employ a special makeup technician just to make people look normal in studio lighting. The same is true for miniatures. Of course, if you are very advanced, you can find a way to set up studio lights to do justice to the paint job. But why should you, if you can just use windows? Now, if you feel you really need an artificial light source because your hobby area is in a basement or something, look for professional studio LED lights with natural color temperature and the right color resolution. The color resolution issue is important because many natural color light bulbs for normal home use give a natural light only as an average across colors and so parts of your models may look off or grayish. I paid around 20 bucks for this professional LED light. Larger ones can be much more expensive, but again, you are not taking pictures of large people. 
Note that for a lamp, you also need something to soften its light. Mine has this plastic cover out of the box, but you may need a soft box for others. Whatever light you pick, set up the miniatures in such a way that the main source of light shines from the side, looking from your camera's perspective. Experiment with this as dependent on the model and the scene you may want to create different contrasts. Now I will give you an example from nature photography. This is of course the so-called tunnel view of the Yosemite Valley. It has been painted and photographed millions of times since Ansel Adams popularized it. But this particular image has something special. Because of a very particular time of the day and day of the year, the sentinel rock to the right drops a dense shadow that looks like a third rock, mirroring the three brothers hidden behind El Capitan. There are also some other shadows from the cathedral rocks and highlights from low autumn illumination, making this picture more interesting than your box standard tunnel view. All cost without human intervention by the sun in the heavens. Coming back to my studio and miniatures. Another tip about light is to never put the source close to the line between the camera and the models. They will look flat or dark if you do. So always remember to keep things a bit off to the side. Also remember to turn off any other lights you may have at home. They most likely have a different color temperature and even one odd light bulb from the hall or something may cause the images to look weird. One thing you may also use is a bounce card, like a box lid, it's absolutely enough. This adds some soft light from more than one direction, but still remember that more light sources mean less contrast, so you have to judge for yourself and fine tune this. Now tip number three. A camera that allows for long exposure times at low ISO. Typical consumer cameras, or the ones in your phone, are rigged for shaky hands. So they shoot at small exposure times and high ISO numbers. This means that photos will have lower resolution independent on the actual capabilities of your equipment. So look at an equipment that can be set to ISO numbers 100, 200, at most 400, and be ready to shoot at times like five seconds or even longer. Some phone cameras have this function as well, by the way. You may have to look for a special app to activate them, but it may be worth a try. Look at these pictures. The one shot at higher ISO, shorter time, is a bit blurry and the colors are less defined. Number four, a tripod. If you want to shoot at longer times, you will need a solid tripod. Unfortunately, as tripods are meant to dampen inertia, they have to have a lot of inertia themselves. This means that heavier tripods are generally better than lighter ones. So get yourself a heavy one. Note that you don't need a remote for your camera. It's nice to have, but it will work as well if you set the camera to auto fire after a couple of seconds. Now don't shoot simply by pressing the button as this will shake the camera a tiny bit and we are photographing tiny things, so disturbances like that do matter. Note that there are also tripods for phones, so if you are using your phone camera, you are not out of luck. Number five, a white balance card. Your models will most likely feel much of the image, and they are very unlikely to have natural colors, like the ones usually found in nature. This has a high potential to put your camera's white balance algorithm off track. I recommend getting a gray white balance card. This is not a random gray piece of paper, but one calibrated to be perfectly gray. You can shoot some extra images with the card lying around the miniatures and then use it as so-called gray point in post-processing. Many cameras allow you to calibrate white balance directly from a gray card so that you don't have to change it on your computer afterwards. Refer to your camera's manual for it. A watch out here is that if you are using natural light, as I recommended earlier, then white balance may change if clouds cover the sun. So you have to rebalance your camera if lighting conditions do change. 
Number 6. Set up sharpness on the model's eyes. Even if you are photographing space monsters, aim for the eyes. Human beings that will look at the image later will instinctively notice any eyes in the frame, so you must make them sharp. If you have several models, line them up in such a way that they are equidistant from the camera. Note that this may mean putting them on an arc, not on a straight line. And finally, tip number 7. Get yourself a macro lens with a good sharpness and a good bokeh. And note here, I am using the standard, not the American pronunciation. So you will hear here Nikon, not Nikon, and Bokeh, not Bokey. Deal with it. There is no way around it. Not all lenses are created equal. First of all, you need a lens with the ability to focus on small things. This is not a given. Lenses that can do it are usually called macro or micro lenses. Look at the minimal distance in its description. You are looking for 20 to 40 centimeters for miniatures and generally less is better, but it depends on the focal length of the lens. Wider lenses need to focus closer. The lens also needs to have a good sharpness. For so-called family shots of your entire collection, the sharpness has to go far to the edges of the frame, which is not given. You have to check it in the lens's specs. Even better, go to a photography-related website for a thorough review. Another thing to watch out for in a lens is its bokeh. It is how it represents the out-of-focus areas. Normal lenses have an ugly bokeh with blinks of light and contrasting dark spots. Good lenses have a creamy bokeh with a smooth velvet out-of-focus blur. This is also not given and you may want again to do some research online to find sample images and judge for yourself. As you can see, I'm using Nikon 40mm micro and 105mm micro lenses and I am super happy with them. I am sure other leading manufacturers like Canon, Sony and so on have good products as well. I have not tested them though. I bought the 105mm lens some 15 years ago, so they last a lifetime and they are a good investment. And that's it! The most important things are a good home studio setup and a good lens. You don't need a large house for that. With the tricks I just showed, you can achieve great results even in a small apartment. I hope you found those tips useful and remember, have fun with your hobby!